Hi, welcome and thank you for attending our talk, Cooperating as Game Workers Cooperative. We are going to talk here about Game Workers Cooperatives and what FWIG is specifically. But first and foremost, hi, nice to meet you. My name is Eva. I'm co-founder of Lucid Tales, which has been founded in 2019. Before that, I studied video games at university, so I'm really fresh in the gaming industry. Alex? Hi, uh, I'm Alex Abukaram, they, them. Uh, I'm currently creative director and co-owner at Soft Not Weak, which is a game worker owned cooperative. Um, I've been in games for about 13 years, I think, since 2008. I've worked on everything from mobile to console titles, uh, mostly indie, uh, some triple I, and uh, yeah, I'm very happy to talk to everyone about co-ops today. Franny? Hi, I'm Franny, or Francesca Eskenazi, um, and I'm the co-founder and CEO and producer at Future Club, which is a new, um, also a game dev uh, cooperative that we started last year. Um, and previously, I worked at uh, Riot Games on League of Legends for about five years, and then I uh, was also at Lab Zero Games and worked on Indivisible, and I got kind of my start uh, back in 2007 at Pandemic Studios. Um, and yeah, I'm just really excited to talk about you know, what we've been up to and, and how we've been um, working together and, and explain a bit more about what co-ops are, um, and hopefully people will understand them a little bit better. Um, so. To get started, um, what is a worker cooperative? Um, uh, in a nutshell, a worker cooperative is an organization that's owned and self-managed by its workers. Um, so it, it, employees govern their business as a democracy. Um, each employee has equal stake and equal voting in co-ops. So um, typically you have one, one member, one share, and one vote. Um, and we worker Worker-owned cooperatives also focus on benefiting the employee owners, not any outside external investors. Um, and we work with we work with uh, we work together among the employees to to come together about business decisions and how to run the company. Um, we also work to give back to the community and um, and help other co-ops as well. Um, and the the really the key the key element about co-ops is is really um, open communication. Um, everything you know is is very transparent and shared among the members, so that everyone understands what's happening in the in the uh, company and are able to influence the direction. There are seven cooperative principles. Um, so although different different co-ops can have different legal entities or legal structures, but as long as they follow the same principles, then they are still considered cooperatives. Um, voluntary and open membership. It's voluntary and open, and there are really clear um, guidelines for how you join. Um, it's democratic member control. So uh, the uh, who is in the leadership roles and who has the authority to make certain business decisions is is determined by the um, the workers electing their leaders. Member economic participation is number three. We all are able to participate in in reaping any profits or benefits, rather than those profits going to um, outside influences. It's autonomy and independence. Um, the fifth is education, training, and information. So making sure everyone has access to um, information within the company about what what decisions are being made. Um, any training that needs to happen is provided. Our sixth principle is cooperation among cooperatives, which is basically what we've been doing here um, among the three of us. Uh, and, and it's really just uh, supporting the other, the rest of the community that is also operating as a, as a cooperative. Um, and lastly, it's concern for community. So really, how are you um, how are you giving back or trying to, um, you know, improve the overall industry? There are a lot of questions that tend to come up um, in in when when we talk about worker co-ops. So we're gonna kind of go into our frequently asked questions and explain a bit uh, more about that. What we did when we were trying to put this together is we thought about like when you say game worker co-op, there's a lot of questions, as Freddie said, that come up. But we also wanted to open it to 
game workers now and see what they were curious about. Um, so we went on Twitter and we kind of collected a lot of the questions of people have asked us and we distilled it into these um, coming questions. I'm gonna start real quick and I'm gonna ask for everyone's input on this, uh, just really to show that there's no one right way to do um, a co-op, especially when uh, the structure is not ready, readily available the way like it is in the US, uh, less so in Canada, but you know. Uh, let's start with who makes the decisions? This one we got a lot. Um, does a co-op imply a flat hierarchy? And do I have to get fully involved in that flat hierarchy? No. <laughs> like it doesn't have to be any of those things. Who makes the decisions? Uh, it depends on your co-op. Does a co-op imply flat hierarchy? It depends on your co-op. Uh, do I have to get fully involved? Again, it depends on your co-op. Uh, let's get a little bit more in details with that because uh, uh, I'm going to start with Franny because uh, the way Future Club does this is really interesting. And I think really like it's a question like people ask a lot of like how you grow. Like it's easy when you're smaller, but what happens when you grow into like a bigger company and you still want to be a co-op? Uh, Franny, what's your take on this question? Um, in our case, because we started with a, a you know, a bit of a larger group than, than the, the co-ops that we've met, you know, where there's less than 10 people, we started with 14. So uh, what we did is we um, sort of agreed that it was best for us to have a board of directors to make most of the sort of business decisions um, or operational decisions about running the company. Um, so those, though we have a board of directors of three, um, we can expand it to, to a larger number as we grow, as the team grows larger, so that it's more representative of the people that um, that are that are you know voting us into those roles. Um, so basically, they, they the the team votes on who is the who is on the board of directors, who are the officers of the company, which are the people who can sort of um, sign legal documents and all of that, and and make kind of the the business decisions. Um, and we also have it set up in our bylaws where. Uh, really, anyone can can be in that role as long as they're elected, and anyone can be recalled in that role if they're sort of not um, if they're not performing in that role the way they should, or, or they're not meeting expectations. Uh, another thing that we are uh, we have in our in our bylaws, and it's not something that we've set up yet, but it's definitely there, and it's something that a lot of co-ops that are much larger than us, um, or a lot of like. The, the, Co-ops that are like thousands of people, um, they is they forming committees and and having um, the workers sort of take on uh, some of some aspects of, of the management of the business through having different committees that are run by uh, by the members. So um, in our case, we we right now have a board of directors, but we're also looking into seeing for certain topics or certain um, certain specific things, um, especially like you know, dispute resolution, um, or if, you know, if conflict arises, having some sort of like conflict committee. Um, so just so that we can all stay accountable, but we basically, yeah, we, we have it so that our board of directors makes uh, most of our business decisions, but anything that affects our bylaws. So if we need to amend or change the bylaws, if we need to change, um, anything that requires, uh, giving another like if we hire someone basically having to dilute their their percentage so if we bring another person on and they're eligible to become a member then they um that would also be like a shareholder at like everyone who has shares in the company would vote um and uh, as well as any any determination about how we are allocating funds for the business um uh, we have like an annual meeting where we kind of go over the plan and the, the, the previous year. So, so really, uh, that's when everyone who has a vote can vote. Um, but in terms of not being wanting to be fully involved, we also have a setup so that if someone maybe doesn't want to be involved in a lot of these decisions, they can assign a proxy to vote in their stead. Um, so there's lots of ways that you know you can still be an owner um, and really participate as as much or little as you as you feel is necessary. So that's sort of what works for us. Um, and I think that's what's going to allow us to, to scale uh, to if we do grow to a much larger team, we'll probably still stay fairly small, but um, it's it's there as a as a way to make sure that it's manageable. Yeah. Um, so that's obviously you don't have a flat hierarchy. Um, I think Ava, uh, Lucid Tales and Soft Not Weak have kind of a similar uh, similar structure. Uh, but I think yours, uh, because of the laws in Canada, is a little bit different. Can you tell us about that? Yes. So, yeah, overall, it, it's the same as how it goes with Future Club, which is you have bylaws, you have dates and elections, and you like people fill in the seats 
um, the board of directors. Uh, here, you need a minimum of three people on the board of directors in Canada, which are the president, the secretary, and the treasurer. Um, from what I've just heard, it's pretty much the same as in the club. You have these three people. And after that, you can have more people on the board of directors, of course, and you can have committees as well. But that's the minimum that you need to run a cooperative. So as long as this is taken care of and it fits your needs as well, you can do pretty much whatever you want in terms of hi hierarchy. Uh, on the studio side, for instance, there, at the moment in, at Lucidel, there's just five of us. So it's not really complicated to manage anyone. And we can just you know, make decisions together and have discussions about pretty much everything. So we still have the voting system for everything that has to do with the cooperative side of the operations. But for the studio side, as far as, like, I mean, at the moment, currently, we don't really need to have a hierarchy uh, because everyone is pretty much uh, multitasking and you don't, need, you, don't, you don't need directors or leads so far. But as we grow, this is something that we'll look into. Uh, what we would like to do eventually if we get more members uh, in Lucid Tales is having a claiming period for which before you start a new product, people can claim the positions that they want to work with uh, for that specific project. So if you feel like, oh, I would like to be a, a lead artist for this project because I put it together and I think I would like to try it. So your personal aspiration regarding the project, this is something that we can discuss and we can vote on as well. So it's not really based on your experience, but more like on your, again, personal aspirations. But Again, we're, there's just five of us at the moment, so it doesn't really apply because we never really get into that kind of specific situation. But that's something that we'd like to explore eventually. Um, but yeah, aside from that, it works pretty much the same way that it works uh, at Future Club with Franny. Uh, it's just that so far we never really had to think in depth of the way they would work inside the collaborative because we don't need that. There's just five of us. Yeah. So how about you, Alex? Uh, I mean, real quick, there's only five of us. We started with three, so there's no board for us. We do everything by vote. Uh, it's kind of a flat hierarchy, except for the fact that uh, everyone is part-time. We all have day jobs except me. I'm the only one who's uh, full-time soft not week. So de facto, I have um, a deference if there's like an urgent thing that needs to be taken care of uh, that isn't money related. Uh, but like an approval or something i'm like the agent for like the co-op right now that doesn't mean that like there's no accountability uh, and that's what people i feel need to understand with this frequently asked uh, question when they ask about flat hierarchy or who makes decisions uh you're not really foolproofing uh for anyone never making any mistakes or everyone's just always being their perfect selves really um you're you're more it's more about like having systems in place for accountability so that if something happens the workers can vote to take like action and then like change things or correct course as opposed to just have someone like careening off the rails uh yeah your involvement also in the soft not week we just talk about it again we're very small and we are very like chill I'm gonna call it chill. I don't know what the technical term is for it, but we're extremely about just talking. So uh, things might take a little longer to get um, to a point, but we have our bylaws to refer to, and that's something everyone's gonna hear a million times. The bylaws. You wanna make a co-op? You need your bylaws. They need to, you know, protect workers. All of that. Uh, and yeah, we just we're kind of flat. Everyone helps where they can because it's an indie and it's video games. And uh, yeah, if you don't want to get fully involved, you can defer to me. And like on the administration side or to our producer jenny on like everything production yeah that's uh, that's kind of how it works for us so next question all right all right so you all have equal ownership does that mean you all get paid the same ava this is the yeah this is a, a funny question because uh i know that a lot of people are really um i wouldn't say fearful but not really sure about equal salaries in general, specifically in the gaming industry. And uh, we actually want to try that. Um, maybe because we're young, maybe because we're inexper inexperienced. I don't know. We just really want to try it just to see how it goes. Because the feeling that we have at Lucid Tales is that uh, we just, you know, value each and everyone's contribution as equally lucrative to the cooperative. So we have a feeling that it's not because you're a programmer that you should earn more than an artist, for instance, but also in terms of experience and in terms of what you bring to the cooperative, 
at the moment, everyone is the same. So uh, we are all fresh out of university. So we're basically all of us in the kind of same situation where we are in debt and we don't have much money. So it felt right to us that we would earn the same in terms of salary. That being said, we're not making any kind of money at the moment. We're really young. So uh, it's not really a question right now. But whenever profit is going to come in, if it comes in eventually, uh, we want to try that flat rate for everyone. And when we get even, you know, extra profit, we're just going to either vote on raising our salaries or getting bonuses or hiring more members. When you, when money comes in the cooperative, this is something that you should know. Part of the money has to be re-injected into the cooperative to make sure that it keeps, it stays afloat and it keeps just running uh, well. But is the rest of the money- Is that a legal thing in Canada? Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, is that it a is. Legal Canadian that, yeah, because yeah, I don't know that it's exactly the same in America just because ah. most states don't have a legal framework officially right. for cooperatives that aren't like agricultural, whatever. Please go on. Sorry, I just wanted to specify this. No, it's this. fine. It's funny because we've been doing this like a few times and we just keep learning stuff about each other. <laughs> it's really fun. Uh, but yeah, at the very least in Canada here, uh, part of the profits has, has to be reinjected into cooperative. And I think it's something like 40 or 50%. So you can just do whatever you want with the money. Part of it has to be reinjected, and that's just much safer for the studio at large. But uh, again, the other part of the profit, you can vote to do whatever you want with it. And the idea at Lucitel so far, we'll see how it goes, would be to add, just to raise our salaries. So you have that flat rate for everyone, but with each year and each project, it just gets a bit higher and eventually would fit everyone's needs. Again, we're not in the situation where we have to be really careful about the needs of everyone because at the moment it fits really our needs, but you never know what can happen. And the main, the main thing, the main important thing to think about when you have a cooperative is we've said it a lot already and we're, we'll just keep saying it, it's communication. We're going to have eventually to address the fact that some people are in different situations and maybe we will just have to adjust bylaws and the way we see our salaries and stuff. But again, at the moment, it's fine. But we're really open to just see if we have to change the formula for any of us. Uh, so how about you, Franny? Um, yeah, so for us, we we didn't do the equal salary um, for everyone necessarily. Um, but what we we had lots of conversations about salary actually very, very, very early on about how we wanted to handle it. Initially, because we were really low on, on funds, we, um, you know, we kind of, there were, there were certainly people who could afford to go without pay and some people who could afford to go with lo much lower pay versus others. So it, it initially at the very, very beginning, it was sort of based on each person's individual like kind of financial needs um, and trying to make sure that, uh, you know, as many of us were, were in, a, in a good place as possible. And then once we, once we got a contract and we had more money coming into the company, we were able to kind of um, implement sort of a lot of the the plans that we talked about initially about how we want to handle salaries. So we did lots of um, we did some surveys with, among the team. Um, uh, Matthew, who's sort of one of the board members with me and, and Mariel, um, put together you know sort of like various proposals for how we could distribute um, salaries based on people's answers to the to the survey. Um, and generally, we do we do acknowledge that um, you know experience level brings you know um, brings additional skill sets and values to the company when you have a lot of experience versus someone who might be like fresh out of school and and doesn't have a, much experience. So we really broke it down into like a tier based um, like salary band. So there's ranges of um, sort of a junior kind of entry level, which when we started, you know, we no one fit in that in that range. We have a couple people who we've hired since um, since then that that are within that range. Um, and and really, we just have basically like a junior, senior and kind of director level tier of salary bands. Um, we also have limits like just straight up like caps on what the most um, someone can get paid is and um, and we also have limits on the the difference between the lowest paid person and the the highest paid person and so it can't be more than a certain amount of money that we agree to um, and that's mainly just to make sure that you know we're we're being fair with with even though someone might be new in the industry you know like it, it doesn't mean that they should be making you know 500 percent less than than you know the CEO or something so really, um, and the, the director level uh, role like, or salary range is really to uh, um, 
sort of account for the additional work that is involved in just being in a leadership position. It, it, there's a lots of added responsibility. There's lots of added, um, you know, just skill sets that you need to have in order to be effective in that role. And so it was it was important for us to acknowledge that 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 has additional um, responsibility and that should you know be compensated. But we also do offer. You know, we we made it a point that one of the things we wanted to do is is be able to provide like health health benefits, like fully covered health benefits for for everyone. Um, so anytime we hire someone, we always account for not just their salary, but like all of the the additional expense for the fully paid medical benefits and medical and vision, because that's something that is just you know uh, it's insane that like we as a country <laughs> like can't uh, can't give that to people. Um, so we, we, it was something we really wanted to make sure we could at least, although our salaries are lower than like the average industry standard because we're indie and you know, um, we can at least cover people's health, health insurance. Um, and that, that was really important because there were several people on our team that really like needed it as well. So um, yeah, that's how we handle it. And I think it's, it's, it's one of these other things where again, like it'll probably change over time as the company changes and grows and as we have more money. And, and that's the thing about like, like as Ava's saying, just to reiterate, like just having lots of communication and talking about, about these things very frequently and openly um, is, is what's like super critical to make sure that everyone understands like, okay, I understand why you know, maybe this year I can't get a raise because it means it'll, it, you know, we'll, we'll be able to operate, you know, for another six months versus if we all get raises, you know, we, we kind of cut ourselves short. So just being able to give people that really clear transparency of like, this is our financial situation as a company. And if we all are get paid this, this is what has how long, how much money we have. And if we all get paid, you know, more or less then that's how that changes. And so that's really like, uh, what I what I enjoy is like being able to have those really open, honest conversations. People can understand like, OK, yeah, you know, at, it's going to be tough at the beginning, but it's an investment that I'm making in this company because I know that in the future, you know, we'll be able to produce something and I'll be able to get like my equal share of that. And that'll just be an extra bonus thing. So, yeah, um, yeah. how we handle salaries. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I really like that. I really love the salary ban thing um, that you do where like the maximum and minimum salary within the company can't like be more than X amount different. I love I think like, like that's such a good application of like socialist ideals under capitalism, which is sounds like an oxymoron. But yeah, um, again, we live in a society uh, for soft Not week. We're kind of like somewhere in the middle where we're extremely all about um, from each according to their ability for each according to their need. Uh, I don't know. Someone said that uh, you might have heard of him. So that whole thing is basically the crux of it is like you got to talk to each other because uh, I really like with like what Ava said, I really think that everyone contributes um, the same amount of value like everyone's um contributions are equally valuable but for me that doesn't mean that everyone's needs are the same so someone who has like a hundred thousand dollars of student debt versus someone uh who has generational wealth and is like in line to inherit from their parents like a house or like you know what i mean who can just like, get like money from their parents or their nito who have like lo lots of savings and then like retirement plan versus someone who has none of that or like who is an immigrant we really try to get all of that into consideration so even if your input into the company is equally valuable your needs might not be and we really wanted that transparency that franny was talking about where we can actually just talk to each other and be like hey straight up this is what i need to live this is the minimum i'm comfortable with just you know living without you know having to eat ramen every day this is like what like and this is like the minimum i'll work for and we want to be able to apply that not just to us but to any contractors we work with but that's we'll talk about that later so yeah for us it's definitely not equal pay it just so happens that we're all not we don't have children and most of us have our health insurance figured out outside of the co-op right now but ideally we want to off offer benefits we want to offer um enough for everyone to live comfortably wherever they're located and we want that total transparency in wages so that um, when someone gets added, they can just kind of be like, this is what I need. And we can be like, this is this is our band. This is what we can afford. This is how little we can give you. And this is how much we can give you. Let's talk about what you need. Uh, and I think that's really an important thing. Uh, honestly, for me, equal salary, when I heard about it, is one of those like boogeymen of like uh, cooperatives where people are like, well, I mean, that's nice ideally, but you know, 
I got things I got to pay for. Uh, so I think uh, it's very important to kind of dispel that myth and be like, no, your bylaws define that as long as you're not trying to exploit anybody and you're basically you have the ac accountability built into your system, um, you don't have to have equal salary for everyone. Uh, next, uh, this one's pretty easy. Hey, ladies, uh, is a co-op necessarily a nonprofit? No. no. <laughs> uh. Co-op is a business for, especially in games. Like we're, we want to make games so that we can make money off of those games, right? So that we can keep making more games. That's the idea. Is that like it? It it can come back to the workers so that they can, you know, have have money to be able to like ideally even just self fund their own projects in the future. That's where we'd like to get to in the future. But yeah, it's, it's a business just like any other business. And there are co-ops that are nonprofit, but most, you know, if you're if you're in game development and you're making games, you, you know, it doesn't matter if you're a co-op or, or not, you're, you're trying to make money. <laughs> yeah, games are like a luxury item. They're not really like a basic necessity or a human right. Uh, so next one, can you hire contractors in a co-op? How does that work? Who wants to take this one? I have my own style, but. Uh, well, I mean, we, yes, we, we work with contractors. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we try to make sh ensure that when we do approach contractors for work, um, that we typically ask them for their, their rates to give us their rates rather than tell them like, this is how much we can afford and give them something, some really low budget thing. Um, we really want to be respectful of what people's own individual, like, self-worth is so we tend to, to ask first and then if it's something that's like way beyond what we can afford and we are able to negotiate then um you know we usually try to do that if it's something that we feel you know if obviously if it fits within our budget we'll we'll go with whatever they ask for if it's if, sometimes people will come back with something that seems a little too low so we'll try to adjust it up to to be fair um but really you know um the main the main thing is like we work with contractors when you need them so that ideally you're not working with contractors like treating them or uh, as if they're a full-time employee but really uh you know hiring them as contractors so you can avoid getting out of paying additional taxes and things um so really you know we use contractors for things where we have an additional need for a, a short period of time so it's like oh we have some animation work we need we, we're going to lean on some contractors and then you know we might go through times where, where there isn't that as much of a need and so um, it, it, yes, it's definitely possible uh, you, you create independent contractor agreements with a co-op in the same as you would with any other business. Um, and something that, that uh, you know, we like to do, which is something that like Wild Blue Studios, um, which is another uh, co-op uh, has done and that has shared with us is, is a, a contractor bill of rights. And, and I think that's, that's something that we're really interested in setting up as well, just so that they have like a clear um picture of like this is what you should expect when you work with us as a contractor and really what are their rights responsibilities so it's like very very clearly outlined um but yeah alex uh, i know you have you guys have a, a different system or like a very specific system of how you work with contractors too yeah our system is a little bit different just because uh, no one on the soft not weak team right now is getting paid because we are owners uh so uh, we're taking that risk together we all decided that we will get money from like doing other jobs and fund um spirit swap development until you know we had revenue which you know games two to four years maybe maybe uh so we have a lot of contractors on spirit swap like spirit swap has like 12 contractors but it's as you said very time things like we had morgan madeline momo um at the beginning for concept art and she was with us for like i want to say three months and then you know now we don't really have as much of a need for concept art it's more assets so now we have our character assets artist um they work a lot on the game they don't work full time um but the things that were important to me when coming to contractors uh because soft not week is membership right now is all liabilities no benefits there's like you get nothing for it except the promise of one day um profits and we work with um crushing majority of marginalized people like uh yeah i do, I'm pretty sure most if not all of our devs that we work with are marginalized either from like a gender perspective or like a race perspective or both so we really wanted to be fair uh so we said what we call uh, an ethical minimum where the five of us got together and we were like what is the absolute least you would work for in the games industry 
what is the absolute least you would work for? And we decided that for us, that floor was $40 an hour. And so that's the basis of all our offers. We're like, and it's been fucking nuts because, uh, can I say fucking nuts? I said it. Uh, it's been uh, a lot because every time we approach someone um, with that, like before we say our rate, they try to like, you know, they'll tell us, oh, my rate is $15 an hour. Is that okay? And I'm like, okay, well, we pay $40 an hour. Um, so that's your rate now. Uh, and it's honestly been really good because like it empowers people to like really feel more valued. Uh, and $40 an hour is by no means like an amazing rate. It's just um, what we can pay to compensate for the fact that we don't have, like, you know, freelancers don't have, they have to take care of their own benefits, they have to take care of their own retirement. So $40 an hour is just really like the minimum you can expect to pay for like the very specific skill set that it takes to make video games, in my opinion, um, in America. Uh, we offer the exact same rate for like people we work with abroad, just because redistributing wealth, uh, it makes sense just because you can live for $5 an hour in I don't know, my country, maybe, probably not even there. Um, doesn't mean that we should pay you less than we pay American contractors, especially when that's what we're budgeting for. And another thing that's important, apart from the ethical minimum, is the path to membership. So when we started Soft Not Week, we had three people, which were the three founders, which was myself, Chris, and Morgan. And you'll notice when I talk now, I talk about five people. Um, and the five people are uh, them, like us three, plus Rajan and Jenny, our producer and our lead UI UX. And they started as contractors. So that path to membership, that transparency to be like, hey, if you want to be part of the team, you can. But just so you know, just so you know, we have no money for us right now. All the money we have is going to contractors to paying them like that rate that we agreed on. And then any th other work we take on ourselves, we do so at our own expense, if that makes sense. And like, you know, the hope of revenue. And these two were like, yeah, okay, let's go. Um, so yeah, it's all about really transparency. And uh, you can just, not everyone wants to join, but everyone should get the option to, if they work X number of hours on a project, like a, set percentage in your bylaws and uh, that's what we're working on right now really determining what that means um when we open membership because again ideally for us it's when we start getting revenue because you can open membership into what just sitting there and making no money whoop to do um and uh yeah how you give people their rights um pushing our contractors to unionize that's one thing we're always like go unionize collectively bargain put your boots on our necks you know just do it uh and uh hopefully it creates that path to accountability um and yeah that's that's what we're trying to do it's imperfect i absolutely agree uh it needs work uh, it's gonna get better but we're figuring it out together um within very strict um mechanisms like under um, american capitalism so you know we're trying to build the best system we can with the help of the other people at FWIGS. Uh, which we never said what that stands for, did we? Fwigs? No, not yet. We probably should, because people are like, what the fuck's Fwigs? Uh, Federation of uh, Worker-Owned Game, what's the S? Studios. Studios. I knew yes. that. Uh, so yeah, accountability. I'm just going to keep saying that. Um, speaking of accountability, what's the mechanism for removing members? What if someone starts acting a complete douchebag? What if someone starts grabbing power? What if someone just disrespects someone? What if there's harassment? Because, you know, people are people. And just because we all want to do our best doesn't mean no one's going to make mistakes or even act in a completely unacceptable way. So we definitely have a process for how we could handle, like, if, if a conflict does arise or if there is a, pro a problem with someone on the team. Um, we basically have reached out to several um, different organizations that offer like uh, facilitation or mediation services that you can sort of pay per, per, per issue. Um, and one of them is, it's, their or name is Aorta. They're, they're actually a co-op. They work with lots of co-ops to, to support and, and help with facilitation and, and difficult conversations. Um, and 
what, what something that we like to do when we have a bit more cash flow and we're able to afford it is actually provide um, mediation and conflict resolution training to everyone on the team and then eventually form sort of like a, a committee, as I was mentioning before, you know, a committee, a dispute resolution committee where the people on that committee are trained and skilled in um, dealing with conflict. So if something happens, you know, anyone on the team can either you know, raise it with their direct, you know, um, sort of discipline lead or raise it with anyone on the board. Um, really, they can raise it at any point with anyone uh, in any way. And and if if it's not something that they feel comfortable reporting to someone on the board or, or their lead, we also, um, our payroll company also has HR services. So we have sort of an, an, an external HR that like they could report anonymously or report anything, um, whether anonymously or not, there, there's like a place to go that isn't someone directly on the team if they don't feel comfortable that, you know, confronting that person on the team. Um, so there's lots of ways that people could bring issues up. And then in terms of like, um, if, if that person, you know, is, is engaging in really problematic behavior, um, it's something that, you know, would just come down to having conversations, uh, looking at uh, having that, that committee or that facilitator kind of put together like an investigation. We can look at like what happened. And um, if it comes down to it, you know, uh, we would vote on, on what, uh, what, whether that person should, should stay or, or what the result, you know, is, whether they should stay and, and have, um, you know, any course of action to, to sort of like disciplinary action um, and put together a plan for how to, to make sure that this doesn't happen again. Or, you know, if they just need to step away from the company because it's, it's, it, they've, they've harmed that many people, you know, everyone on the team has a say and has a voice and has a vote. And um, that that's how we would handle it if it, if it came to that. Um, it was really important for us to make sure that all of us were on the same page as to like what that process was um, very early on because um, you know it's something that we've kind of been through before and it wasn't fun and so we want to make sure that we kind of have that safeguard in place um, and really you know again I think that's the 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 beauty of having a co-op is that um, you know you your fate is really determined by your own voice and vote in in what you you know how how your organization runs um, is you can directly influence it because of that. Yeah, for us, uh, we had uh, in our bylaws since we had some friction in the beginning uh, over how like how active members were. Which I know you're gonna be like, "There's five of you. How are you doing this?" Uh, day jobs become a lot, but we realized very early on that we needed a system uh, for specifically uh, removing members or flagging members. So uh, we we talked together in the bylaws, and we have basically definitions now for what an active member is versus an inactive member, and different provisions for both, and, and also different um, duties versus rights for those different like activations. Cause sometimes someone is like, I don't want to work on this project, but I still want to be part of the co-op. So we wanted to like allow for that. Or like if someone needs to go on a sabbatical, cause you know, something happened in their life, wanted to allow for that. Uh, and that allowed us to think really early on, uh, on what would it look like if we needed to remove a member. And what it came down to for us was you got to reach quorum and you got to vote. Uh, another thing we have is an internal anonymous form for HR complaints that all five of us have access to. Uh, and that one is also open to our contractors. So whenever anyone has like a, well, I called HR, I hate that word, but it's more like of like a raising like a common box that we check regularly. And whenever someone has an issue or like so far, yeah, so far it's been empty. So I don't know what's going to happen when someone puts an issue in there. But ideally, if there's an issue and you feel like you can't talk to each other, you can put it in there and then we would call a meeting and talk about it together and vote on the outcome. And if it's about a person in particular, we would talk about that with them, uh, either have like a path to rehabilitation or if it's something like um, like harassment or abuse or like something like something like that, uh, then we would just have to take a vote and uh, remove the member basically and just kind of like vote them out so it's all in your bylaws really and as franny said uh it's better to figure it out while everyone's getting along even though it's so counterintuitive to be like everyone's happy what happens when we fight yeah it's it's better to figure it out now at the very beginning than wait for you to fight and be real mad about it and now we have no idea how to like resolve anything which is a whole thing what about you eva 
yeah, the, the the I think it's really hard to, to to think about that in a really objective kind of way when everyone is getting along, and specifically when there's not much people, because just as Soft Not Week, we're five official members, and you you don't want to think about uh, maybe Sunday, and you don't want to deal with it either. Uh, but sometimes, maybe the best thing that you could do about it would be to reach out to someone who's not in the collaborative, some exterior resource to help you. Because if you feel like this is something that you cannot take on and you don't really know how to deal with it, and I think, it, I mean, it's fair. Uh, all of us, again, we're just fresh out of university, so we don't have much experience with dealing with these kinds of issues. But reaching out to an external so source to help you figure out these kinds of issues may be the best help that you can get because first of all they have the experience they know how to get you through this but also if people yeah feel awkward talking to each other because the issue is too big or too awkward for them to to deal with directly in front of the person who's concerned about it well they can just reach out to someone so uh but see that's a very good example of what we've done badly so far is that we haven't figured out precisely a how do we deal with these kinds of issues so as franny said the first step is communication most of the time you don't even have to reach out to someone else so it doesn't have to get too big you can just talk to each other all right um i think that's a lot of it uh most of the uh, questions that we got um, so yeah, in conclusion, why would you choose the cooperative business model? Uh, yeah, I'm just going to say it. Um, it's not about you. Uh, and if you care about collective good and, um, workers owning their labor, uh, honestly, this is the best system I think we have under capitalism. You'll notice it's very flexible. So you can absolutely make a cooperative full of douchebags and be a cooperative of douchebags and just be like a fucking blight on society. Um, <laughs> don't. <laughs> but don't. Don't do that. <laughs> but don't do yeah. that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's honestly, it's about mechanism of accountability. And the really cool thing about Frigs and about this cooperation of, co of, of game worker co-ops is that there is accountability within the group. Uh, and being in a group like Frigs really like gives me that perspective and it allows me like to be accountable when I talk about these things to people at Wild Blue, to people at Lucid Tales, to people at uh, Future Club, uh, to see what they think. And they can tell me, hey, Alex, uh, that's fucked up. Or, hey, Alex, that doesn't go with um, the cooperative principles. Uh, so yeah, it's these discussions are really important. So why choose a cooperative business model? Why choose to be in a cooperative of cooperatives? Because uh, it keeps you honest and it keeps you um, fair and it makes sure that the benefits uh, end up with the workers, uh, workers' rights, brings empowerments, uh, sharing of project ownership between members, all of that good shit. So do it. Ideally do it in Canada, right, Ava? So Canada, in uh, 2019, there were 5,812 active non-financial cooperatives recorded by Statistics Canada, which is roughly 105,000 uh, workers. So Canada is a really cooperative country, but uh, the worker cooperative is not the model that's most known. Usually it's more housing cooperatives that people know and the financial cooperative of the Bank Desjardins that people know because it's really widespread in Canada. Uh, but aside from that, they know they, they don't know shit about what a cooperative is. So it's really important to make sure that people around you know what you are and why you exist so they can, you know, open doors again. Um, but that being said, there are um, we've had we've worked with uh, the CDFQ, which is the first logo that you can see, which is the regional de uh, cooperative development in Quebec. These people are here to help you become a cooperative and spreading knowledge and awareness of what cooperatives are, basically. So these people are specifically for francophones, but you also have the CWCF, which is the Canadian Worker Co-op Federation, which is in the rest of Canada. And these people have the same mission. It's just helping you building a cooperative, understand how it works legally, internally and stuff, and providing you with resources as well and help whenever you need. Uh, so you can reach out to these people to get help and information and to just build yourself as a cooperative. And it's really nice to know that these people exist because if we didn't have them, I don't know if we would have done 
I don't know if you would be a cooperative today, to be honest. We've been thinking a lot about, do we want to be a link? Do we want to be a cooperative or something else? And all the values around the cooperative uh, is what helped us make the decision. But we got we, we consider our, ourselves really lucky that these people exist because if they weren't there, it would have been so hard. There, there are a lot of things to know about it. It's not that complicated, but if you don't know about it, finding the resources yourself is really tough. And um, again, we're lucky because we're Canadians, but we see our friends in Flags from the States and anywhere in the world struggling to find like just information around the cooperatives and help. So if you're in Canada, if you're planning to move to Canada, if you want to move your studio to Canada or anything, like, just know that these people exist and they can provide help. But that being said, Flags, that's the end of my sentence. Twigs. <laughs> <laughs> if you need help, you can find help in Twigs. Um, yeah, so let's talk about Twigs and what that is. So it's the Federation of Worker-Owned Game Studios. It's, it's a very new group. Um, it basically is uh, an organization made up of other worker-owned game companies, um, game studios. And we, we, as a sort of, as our mission, as a group, is to really revolutionize the gaming industry and empower workers to advocate for fair wages, safe work environments, ownership of their work, and provide resources and knowledge about cooperative principles to the members and the public. It's a way to have like a support group of other people who are like-minded and, and who are, um, you know, maybe have gone through something that you're not sure how to go through. So it's a way for us to like get advice, support, share knowledge, share resources among each other. Um, and it's been really great. And this is actually one of the first sort of projects that we've that we've done as a group of, of really getting out there and, and speaking about what, what co-ops are and, and helping to educate more people in the games industry about them because it's definitely a model that, you know, if 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 this is if all those principles of um, are something that speak to you, you know, you you have this group as a resource to um, to learn more about it and to um, you know just help guide you through that process. Yeah, it was just started as a support group for co-op for game cooperatives, basically. A Wild Blue Studio that started it. They're in California. They started it at the beginning of the pandemic, where they're like they wanted someone like to find other like-minded like people to talk to and like maybe get through like this global disaster together uh and it grew from there uh and now like everything that we talked about in like the the talk uh about uh, elections and quorums and board of directors and like codes of conduct and all of that stuff bylaws um we're working on opening it um to others and we're here at gdoc specifically because so far freeze is real white it's very very white Fwigs. It could stand to be less white uh, massively. So yeah, don't let the three of us fool you. Um, yeah, uh, we're here because I think marginalized uh, people really could benefit from that structure. And uh, if democratizing the games industry or like the game worker co-op model uh, is the right way to go, the first people who should get all the resources are historically marginalized um, communities. Uh, a marginalization we see mirrored in um, the games industry. So that's why we're here. Um, we want you, uh, if you have any questions, to come to us. And if you want to make a co-op and you're like, hey, what do I do? We're here. Come talk to us. Um, here are some freaking resources for you if you don't want to talk to us without checking them out. So yeah, so we're, we're in the, still in the process of kind of developing all of our branding and website and, um, you know, kind of doing like our official launches flags. Um, uh, where we'll be able to provide all this information to the public as well as information about membership and how to join if you're if you're already a co-op that wants to be part of it. Um, but in the meantime, there is a Game Dev Worker Cooperative Discord that anyone can join. It's open to everyone. The link is here on the slide. Um, and it's it's really just if you want to learn more, you want to we're, we're there um, and we're you know you can ask questions there. Um, and then there are some other resources here um, like the Game Workers Unite and uh, the National Cooperative Business Association, AORTA, which is the facilitation um, co-op that I they spoke to uh, earlier. Then we have this other uh, slide that has more information about lawyers, and we also have a couple links in here for funds that um, might be able to help fund, they, they understand and, and work with co-ops. And um, yeah, hopefully we'll be able to have a, a live Q&A um, 
in our in our Discord in the game um, game dev workers co op uh, Discord soon. So yeah, if you still have questions, uh, we're around. Uh, you can find us pretty easily. Um, come talk to us. Come find Fwigs and talk to them. Um, to them, us, you know. And uh, yeah, let's uh, let's get this going. Let's do a thing. Let's revolutionize the games industry. Thanks for listening. <laughs>